Hello and welcome back to the Indian Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Raj Balkaran. More importantly, you are looking for informative, entertaining, inspiring wisdom bombs that you can use in your everyday life. So I was actually with a client yesterday, a life guidance client, and she asked the question, so which is it, nature or nurture? Which is it, she asked. Now, the very question presupposes a binary at play. It's in the consciousness of either this or that, either this or that, is it this, is it that. And that could be quite useful without question to disambiguate, to demarcate, to use our critical thinking, our slicing and dicing brain, which of course, if it works well, is called sharp, in order to cut apart one thing from another, to disambiguate. But life is complex. It's multivalent. And wisdom requires that we are able to fold in multiple perspectives. And so I responded, well, it's both. It's both at different times. They are both aspects of karma. I invoked this profound and insightful theory of human experience that the ancients have come up with karmic theory. We'll talk all about the mechanics of karma today, the extent to which nature and nurture are aspects of karma, and the extent to which karmic theory transcends even these categories. And ultimately, to my mind, dances around the tension between free will and determinism, between fate and between the freedom to act. Much like nature versus nurture, which is it? Karmic theory doesn't force one to choose between the two. It wisely leaves space for the folding in of each. Why? (laughs) Because with which can you dispense your right hand or your left? We've all experienced profound moments of the hand of fate upon us more than projections of mind. Things have appeared and felt and been experienced as utterly destined without question. We've all had this experience. And without question, we've also experienced the exertion of our free will. So which is it and how do they communicate, collaborate? Okay, so back to the question of nature or nurture. What I unfolded for the client was the extent to which they're both accounted for through karmic theory as one's ripening karma. Oh, what's karma? The word karma comes from the Sanskrit verbal root kru, which means to do. It literally means actions. Now, words accrue various connotations, various meanings, various colors over time. Yes? Um copious uh, numerous examples come to mind the word set well is it a set of things is it a mathematical set it is is it a set um, upon which one records a film yes Uh, numerous examples come to mind so karma while it literally means action in ancient ancient vedic times Karma meant ritual action, more so than any particular kind of action, because ancient Vedic uh, religiosity was predicated upon um, uh, scrupulous ritual action, action performed with, with great care and effort and precision in terms of mantric recitation, in terms of order, in terms of accompanying hand gestures, etc., etc., etc. So action meant specifically technically pertaining to the vedic ritual now throughout the history of indian religions karma comes to primarily mean something else something that doesn't really come from originally the ancient vedic Hindu aryan worldview but comes from a, a powerful revolutionary set of ideas that gets folded in 
to the Vedic worldview. That is the theory of karma, the theory of reincarnation, the theory of rebirth, samsara. So powerful is this idea or series of ideas. So compellingly does it address the human experience that it becomes the dominant worldview across South Asian traditions, across Indic religions, if you will, across Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism. And it is so compelling a worldview, the notion of karmic theory, reincarnation, rebirth, that it has been adopted by a great many, uh, even in the West, who may otherwise identify as Christian or spiritual but not religious, etc., etc., etc. It is a fascinating theory, a theory that we've all been here before. And we will all return here again. Okay? That's a radically different notion than the notion that your life began at birth, your existence began at birth, your existence will end at death. Okay? Why on earth would anyone adopt this worldview? What's in it for them? What does it account for? Well, overarchingly, I'd say there are three phenomena that this theory aims to address. One, the idea that we meet up with people with whom we seem to already be connected. Certainly, there are people who we come across in various enterprises uh, who may have commonalities. Uh, we join a hockey team. Someone else enjoys playing hockey, enjoys... Um, hockey cards or etc etc uh, is, is an avid watcher of, of hockey games and etc etc they're really into the culture so there's that commonality it's explicable that one would connect over common interests having said that there are individuals whose paths we cross who feel very familiar very connected and our minds scramble to understand why that would be, because it is not as if they come from a particularly similar socio-cultural circumstance. They might be from a very different background, a different age, a different gender, etc., etc., a different culture, and yet click, we feel as if there's a coming home, as it were. We feel as if this person feels familiar. There's instant comfort, yes. And we've all had these sorts of experiences. In these sorts of relationships there are relationships which we invent and reinvent and then there are relationships which we discover according to karmic theory well how could we discover them well they already exist how could they already exist well these are people with whom we've transacted before in previous lifetimes in various incarnations in various bodies in various circumstances we've interacted with them before and we've taken birth in part to exhaust our karma, exhaust the interaction remaining with them. Okay, so one overarching um, idea that supports this theory, or otherwise put, one overarching phenomena that has inspired this theory is the mystery of human connection. Above and beyond this, there is the utter mystery of human proclivity. You know, we all have different temperaments. Some of us are more introverted, extroverted. Some of us are more, you name it, right? There are various elements of personality, of penchant, that populate the human experience. But some of us have very, very specific draws and skills and interests. A gentleman born and raised in New York City from um, you know from a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant background and they have an interest in and an utter knack for Vedic astrology <laughs> and they become uh, an incredible uh, fairly famous in their niche um, astrologer and those who are from Indic origin, who are interested, are studying with this person who is prima facie, a Westerner. Now, there are, for example, one watches 
American Idol. There are talent shows where we see very young people with extraordinary talent, not just loosey goosey, well, musicality and the like, right? But people who are able to play the guitar, play the violin, play the piano at a very young age. Well, of course, we can chalk it up to perhaps some, some combination of uh, manual dexterity <laughs> and musicality. But we've all seen you know, very young singers command a stage, singing opera the likes of which would take decades to learn to attain such presence, such command, such control of tone and pitch and rhythm. So there's no dearth of examples of individuals who possess remarkably learnt behaviors, seemingly innately. Okay, so this is a second overarching bucket, if you will, that karmic theory um, depends on or accounts for, however you want to think of that. Third, I would say, is um, suffering. The problem of suffering, this pesky little problem of suffering, which plagues the human experience, the human condition. What is it for? What is it all about? How do we make sense of suffering? Karmic theory posits that suffering can be attributed to previous karmas. So the word karma is a little bit ambiguous. So let us disambiguate the word karma in terms of the different kinds of karma. Karma means action, yes. In this context, it means both the actions you undertake and karma, i.e. the principle, the principle of karma, which governs the human experience. The idea is that we are all participating in a field, a karmic field, if you will, governed by the principle of karma, comparable to um, third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Comparable to that, we have this metaphysical idea that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction upon the agent. The difference being that unlike conventional time-space, the ripening of the action is not instantaneous. And it doesn't really cohere to the regular laws of causation. The idea is that there is a karmic field that is soil <laughs> for the fructification of our karmic consequences. As we reap, so shall we sow. Other way around, actually. As we sow, <laughs> so shall we reap. But I think you get the idea. As we plant, so shall we harvest. Now, it is a simple, uh, but rather, to my mind, elegant series of ideas that, based on the experiences that we have occasioned others, those are experiences that somehow cling to us in some sort of strange metaphysical version of quantum entanglement. Now, I'm not positing necessarily that the quantum field holds the answers to spirituality. There's some who may say yes, there's some who may say no. Who knows, frankly? I think it's a fascinating parallel that the quantum universe behaves beyond mysteriously. It, in some ways, tends to corroborate what some spiritual traditions have been positing. But pseudoscience is not what I do. I do scholarship well and I do spirituality well. And I'm quite cognizant of where to do which <laughs> and for whom. This, of course, is a spiritual podcast, right? And so we're entertaining the idea that karma is real. Karmic theory is real. We've all been here before, propelled by our previous actions. So karma is this principle that that propagates this, this process that brings us forth in various circumstances, life after life. But karma also means not just the principle of karma, but it means the actual circumstance. Oh man, someone ran into you, someone ran into your car. <laughs> That's bad karma, man. Well, 
what it, what does that person mean? What they're talking about is karma, i.e. the ripening circumstance. Okay, so this karma, the principle, and to use the, the technical Sanskrit term prarabdha, the, the karma that is fructifying in your field of circumstance. So, from the perspective of karmic theory, your nature, your swabhava, the, the, the proclivities and skills with which you were born, present at birth, in the process of fructifying, these are your prarabdha karma. Right? You're presently fructifying karma. The fruit of your previous actions. And prarabdha does not aim to include only your nature, but also by and large your nurture. From the prarabdha karma, one can ascertain the circumstances which receive that individual, particularly in their formative years. So one of the practices that is very common throughout the Indic world is the casting of an astrological chart. I'll tell a tale, perhaps today, about dire forecasting <laughs> um, in such a situation and the interplay between destiny and free will. But the casting of the chart tells you what? Whether or not we believe in the efficacy of such things, the principle is such that the chart is an omen the position of the planetary bodies at the time of birth functions as a very complex omen, a sign of the fructification of that person's karmic circumstance in this life, their prarabdha. What they experience as destiny, in a sense both nurture and nature, are a function of their product of karma, the result, the fructifying consequence of their previous actions. Aha! I knew it! Karmic theory is fatalistic! Well, no. <laughs> Écoutez bien. Listen carefully. <laughs> if it is the case that there are elements of your existence that are a result of your previous fructification, and we see this, we see this insofar as for some individuals landing a job is utterly simple easy whatever they're looking for maybe they can't get a date for five minutes for other individuals they can't be employed for five minutes they can have you know eight different dates in one given week <laughs> we see that in various individuals lives uh, there are aspects of life which seem to flow and aspects not so much and it differs from person to person and so this would be used to corroborate the idea of um, meritorious or non-meritorious karma, papa or punya, Sanskrit terms. Punya, meritorious karma, favorable karma. Papa, non-meritorious, unfavorable karma in a previous lifetime. Perhaps the individual struggles with relationships in this lifetime because they had taken them for granted or had been somewhat abusive or dismissive in, in previously etc 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 apply that logic throughout the various experiences one has in life but this is all fatalistic right because everything you're experiencing is because of your previous karma well think about this if you undertook previous karma freely then those were free actions which warrant these circumstances so that which flows into your karmic field, whether you construe it as nurture or nature, that which is ripening in your karmic field is not the extent of your experience. The fact that there is a storm afoot is not the totality of your experience of your fate. Your destiny is not to get wet merely because it is about to rain or already raining. <laughs> you have the opportunity, typically, to find shelter. Umbrellas, raincoats, roofs. These are aspects, manifestations, potentially, of kriyamana. 
free karma, that being undertaken, also from the verbal root kru. Kriyamana karma has to do with that which you are undertaking at present, the actions that you are undertaking. Those actions will accrue future karma. That is your agami karma, that which will ripen in future. Okay, so if you've been here, life after life, age after age, eon after eon, you've had a great many lives. Perhaps dozens of them were as primates. <laughs> Perhaps you'll look at two 20 year olds and um, person A is having his first or second life out of primate species and is really struggling. <laughs> Even by the time he's 60 to stop flinging his stuff at other people or to control his more animal appetites. Perhaps person B has had a hundred lifetimes as a human being and is fairly self-composed and fairly evolved and has arrived with that level of maturity. In English, we call it an old soul. Well, what does that mean? Well, karmic theory says they've been around the block. Yes, so you have person A and you have person B. And they perhaps have had different karmic antecedents, so they're in different situations. Okay, But they both have the power to choose. And that power to choose will create karmic results for the future. Now, it is not possible, if you've been here hundreds and hundreds of times, it is certainly not possible to reap all of your karmas in one life. Your prarabdha is that which is destined, scheduled to ripen in this life. But there's a massive storehouse of all of the karmic residue, of all of the actions you've ever undertaken. <laughs> Since you were an amoeba, perhaps. Who knows? That is your sanchita, the amassed karma. It's your storehouse of all of the karmic residues, the portion of which ripening in this life is your prarabdha. But... You still have the power to exert your kriyamana, your free will action. And that will necessarily result in future fructifying agami karma. Now, this theory explains the sticky situation in which we all find ourselves. Pushed and pulled by the ripening of our prarabdha, ignorant of the massive heap of sanchita to be exhausted over God's know how many lifetimes, you know, exerting our kriyamana in response to our circumstances, for good or for ill, creating agami or future karma. And so the cycle continues ad infinitum forever, if allowed. So karmic theory as rich as it is in so far as explaining and accounting for the human experience, it is merely the diagnosis <laughs> of classical Hindu thought, classical Indic thought. This is the diagnosis. This radically different worldview that stems from renouncer tradition says, hey, this whole cycle, this karmic cycle of samsara, of birth and death and rebirth, over and over and over and over again. This cycle, this is the cage. You're trapped. The goal of human experience is to, in the words of Queen, break free. I want to break free. Indeed. And... So much so that the breaking out of this, the goal of this, in classic Hindu thought, is called moksha. Moksha is the cessation 
of the cycle of birth, death, rebirth of samsara. And it comes from the verbal root much, which means uh, to free. It literally is seeking freedom from the bondage of cyclical existence. And that freedom is accompanied by, or even occasioned by, awakening. It is our blindness which perpetuates the roles we play in the stage of life. All the world's a stage indeed. And you are not just one actor. You've been many, many actors in many different roles. And once you have gained the requisite wisdom and awareness and insight, you can pierce beyond the mask of who you think you are and even beyond the mask of who you think others are and see that all of this is the play of the eternal self. This whole cyclical creation has been engineered for the sake of education. Education not of an intellectual sort so much, of a spiritual sort. Material creation is the greatest wisdom school ever created. We've all been enrolled, whether we like it or not. <laughs> some of us move on to different grades and levels, and some of us retake the same, you know, grade three math, you know, grade seven biology, whatever it is. Whatever lesson we're stuck on, some of us have to retake that placement test over and over and over again. For none of the tests are pass-fail tests. All of the tests are placement tests. To see which level of the matrix, as it were, to unlock next for your continued growth. Now, the issue is that there are aspects of your actions which are free, that you're freely undertaking. And there are aspects which are not actions, they're reactions, they're responses. The greater your wisdom, the greater your capacity to discern, the greater your ability to see, to abide and witness or see your consciousness, to adopt the language of the Yoga Sutras, the greater your ability to choose. Because the more freedom you have from the reactive self, the impulsive self, the instinctive self, how many of your actions have you truly chosen? And how many of your actions were not actions at all? They were merely reactions to stimuli based on learned responses, based on habits. Yes, this is the nature of karmic theory. Which of your actions are born of circumstance? Which are instruments of destiny? If you are destined to have a job, karmic theory isn't saying that all jobs are destined. It's saying that some are, some are open. Some elements of your life are destined. Not everything is destined. But if we are, for the sake of argument, for the sake of illumination, examining a situation that is destined, for example, a particular uh, employment opportunity. If person A is destined to get this job because of their karma, that means that the interview, while it is the instrumental cause on the material level, the side of reality that we can all see, it is not the ultimate cause. And that means that the employer or the committee, whomever is adjudicating your candidacy for the job, they are not doing so freely. <laughs> they are doing so in that situation as instruments of destiny because there is no other possible outcome but for you to land that position because it's your karma, because you have karma to exhaust with a dozen people at that workplace. And this is the only circumstance in which it can be exhausted in this life. And so, this is why perhaps it's firm karma or destiny that you land this position. Whereas other positions may not be nearly so firm nor firm at all. 
Karmic theory is a spectrum. Indic traditions don't dole in switches, they deal in dials. Dimmer switches. Right? There is no zero sum game. Shades of gray. Yes? Certain aspects of your life are destined. Certain aspects of your life are of your free accord. Certain aspects are combinations. Shades of gray. In this mysterious wisdom school we call reality. Now, it might be useful fodder for thought were I to tell a tale that that brilliantly encodes and encapsulates the tension between free will and destiny and the mystery of karma. Yes? Well, long ago on the outskirts of the holy city, Benares, Benares is the anglicized name for what? Uh, Varanasi. You know, Varanasi. Uh, which is yet another name for the ancient city, Kashi. Kashi is more than a granola bar. <laughs> Kashi might possibly be the oldest inhabited city on the globe, or one of them, certainly. It's been continuously inhabited for at least three millennia. It is along the banks of the Ganges, one of the, the most holiest cities in the Indic world. Okay, But in the outskirts of the holy city of Kashi, there lived a peasant couple to whom were born a son. The couple gathered what little money they had to pay for an important service, important in that culture and indeed even in current Indic culture, to hire an astrologer to cast the birth chart of their son. Why would they want to fly blind when they can gain some insight into the destiny of their child? But astrologers, like a great many uh, practitioners, tradespeople, like mechanics, like accountants, like computer repair folks, they come in various stripes. Some are charlatans, without question. Some are modestly skilled, and some are divinely gifted. They're excellent at their craft. I've had the good fortune of meeting the latter, which, you know, ended up helping me shift my worldview about some 20 years ago. Uh, I considered karmic theory more intellectually, actually, to sort of test it out and see if it made sense to my mind. Now, in the intervening 20 years, I've had a number of profound spiritual, um, I have to say, larger-than-life experiences. And now it's just a question of perception, perspective, and insight more than belief. But nevertheless, I've had the good fortune of meeting some utterly gifted folks, uh, Beyond belief, to say the least. Okay, But this wasn't the luck of this poor peasant couple. Their prarabdha was different. Given their financial situation, they could only afford a low-grade astrologer. But, you know, it's better than no astrologer, right? Little knowledge is better than no knowledge at all, right? <laughs> the minute the astrologer cast the birth chart of the boy, he began to shake his head and launch into dire forecasting. Clearly, this man hasn't taken any counseling courses. Oh, dear! <laughs> exclaimed the astrologer. Your son was born with, and we'll mention some astrological patterns, or neither here nor there for your understanding of the tale. But for those of you who are in the know of astrological archetypes, particularly the Indic world, these might be of interest to you. Oh, dear! Your son was a, born with an exalted Saturn, i.e. that Saturn in the sign of Tula Rashi. What is that? Libra. Neither here nor there for the gist of the tale. But for you Jyotish nerds out there, <laughs> you'll catch a drift. Your son was born with an exalted Saturn in the first house, conjoined with Ketu, the south note of the moon, the tale of the dragon, as it were, in the mythology. Denial, deprivation, destruction will accompany him throughout his life, afflicting all who come into contact with him. Having heard enough of the astrologer's gloomy predictions, the couple left his office riddled with desperation and despair. You see, the wise, or at the very least the compassionate, realize that all counsel is born of compassion and aimed at relieving suffering. That's not to say that things need to be glossed over or ignored or even sugar-coated, but it means to say that 
proper counsel is geared at fortifying the individual, strengthening them, empowering them to deal with what is to come. Now, this astrologer clearly doesn't have um, profound people skills here, right? So they left his office and they were beside themselves. Life was such a struggle as it was. They had so little as it was. How are they going to deal with the poor karma, the destiny of this child? Right? But more importantly, their instinct is to protect him. How could they protect him? They're already, you know, racked with concern in terms of how to feed and clothe him. But how could they possibly protect them from this dire fate? And so day in and day out, they were just beside themselves, racking their brains in terms of what they could do. After much torturous deliberation, they came to, you know, an excruciating, agonizing decision. They would offer their son into the holy Ganges so that his sins may be purified and he would be spared the life foretold. They wrapped him with care, walked the long journey to the holy city Kashi and went into the great Kashi Vishwanath temple, the temple of Shiva, ancient, ancient, powerful temple to Lord Shiva on the banks of the Ganga. They offered a prayer to Shiva and asked him to protect their son's soul as they made this dreadful decision. They made this painful offering, kissing their child lovingly, miserable at what they are about to do. They placed their child into the river. Now, perhaps contemplate at some point, the end of the tale, you know, are they undertaking free karma? Is this Kriyamana? Is this Prarabdha? Is, there your des- is this their destiny? <laughs> More on this at the, at the end of the tale. Offering a prayer of penance and protection to the holy Ganges, they offer their son into the river. Soon after being submerged, a child was swallowed by a great fish and carried in his belly down to the bottom of the river. To his great surprise, the child's ears were filled with the powerful voice of Shiva himself. What was Shiva doing? He was expounding philosophy. To whom was he expounding it? To the goddess Parvati, his spouse, in their aquatic abode beneath the sea. Shiva was teaching on the play of the grahas, the planets, the planetary bodies, which, according to Indic thought, impact human destinies. They dispense the karmas. Great God Mahadeva, said Parvati, Thank you for the explanation on the nine planets that dispense the karmas of beings born on earth. The boy heard Parvati saying, You are wise, but tell me, Lord, does this mean that humans are mere puppets pushed and pulled by the strings of the celestial bodies? Have they no agency of their own? Great goddess, what a brilliant question. Of course humans have free will, and that they exert at every turn. It is in fact their free actions, their karmas, their kriyamana karmas, that determine their destinies, their parabdha. They choose how they plant and harvest, yet the sun and rain and soil is out of their grasp, beyond their control. Destiny too is real. This is the great paradox of mortal life. The two wheels on the chariot of the human condition free will and destiny both. It's a paradox. It can be reconciled by mere intellectual slicing and dicing. The child was astounded to overhear the rich wisdom that ensued from their conversation. He listened carefully. He listened intently day in and day out, receiving teachings for 12 long years. 12 is an interesting number. It's actually a cycle of Guru of Jupiter. It takes Jupiter 12 years to circle um, to circle the skies, the heavens, the zodiac. Twelve years is also very interesting in so many cultures. Once a human being has lived twelve years, ish, there is a rite of passage, a communion, a bar mitzvah, a bat mitzvah, etc., etc. So twelve years pass, and this child, who is obviously much more than a child, is being trained, schooled by Shiva himself. He learned spiritual truths about all the branches of ancient wisdom traditions, the Vidyas, expounded by Shiva himself. He learned about yoga, Ayurveda, 
Vedanta, and various branches of spiritual knowledge. He grew wise. And when his learning had been completed, he emerged. The divine fish who swallowed him, sent by the gods, brought him to the surface again. This is also a brilliant metaphor of the unconscious. Water often represents the unconscious. Unconscious knowing, unconscious learning, being brought to the conscious mind in time of need. You know far more than you think you know. Because thinking is not whereby you know it. <laughs> by virtue of thinking, sometimes you block intuitive knowledge. But when the intellect is able to allow instinctual knowledge, intuitive knowledge to arise, it can yield quite profound results. But, you know, metaphor of the unconscious notwithstanding, let us continue with the tale. The fish emerged on the banks and spit him out. And he was born on the banks of the Ganges as a great spiritual teacher, Matsyendra, Lord of Fish. Matsyendra taught far and wide in the holy city and across the countryside. He brought wisdom and awareness wherever he went, teaching the ancient art of yoga, yoga consciousness, right? The supreme awareness was his favorite. In due course, he made his way to the very village where he was born and gave a sermon one night. For some reason, he felt inspired to share the wisdom of the very first transmission he received, first in many ways as foremost. As we've discovered in the first podcast of this series, with first and foremost among the gods, Ganesha. But that is a tale for another day. <laughs> but you know, this first teaching was very, very important to his destiny, and he felt inspired to share it. He expounded the importance of the planetary bodies and their power to dispense karmas, and he explained the extent to which they work in tandem with free will, the extent to which we can meet the storms, we can weather the storms, we can meet the difficulties of life with particular outlooks and particular tools to manage what is to come. At the end of his sermon, he offered some loving cautionary advice about the need to seek out a very high caliber astrologer. You know, there are lots of nut jobs out there, he said. <laughs> you know, the rationalists have it right. A bit of critical thinking goes a long way. There are a lot of people who are nuts or just profiteers peddling so-called solutions to the vulnerable. But there's more to the story than this. There is a divine science, if you will, of astrology. And there are those who can wield it with exceptional grace and skill to counsel folks on how to navigate life on solid footing, irrespective of the weather about them. You know, as soon as he finished, a grief-stricken peasant couple fell to the floor weeping uncontrollably. But Siendra went straight to them filled with compassion. Swamiji, muttered the father in between sobs, we are poor peasants with love in our hearts but without teaching such as yours to weather the storms we faced in this life. We put our faith in, this, in an astrologer some twelve years ago. He was all we could afford. He made such dire, disastrous predictions about our precious boy that we said a prayer to Lord Shiva and offered him to Mother Ganga. Denial, deprivation, destruction, the man recalled, will accompany him throughout his life, afflicting all who come into contact with him, said the astrologer. We had no way to protect him. Lord, what have we done? The couple broke down and fell to the floor, weeping in utter misery. Matsyendra's eyes were opened, and through his inner divine sight, he knew exactly who these people were. Mother, father, you have done nothing more than fulfill your destiny, and to help me fulfill mine. It is I who you discarded so lovingly in the ocean. I was carried down by a fish to the bottom of the sea, where I was schooled by Shiva himself. This is all part of the divine play. The astrologer was right in a sense, but he lacked the wisdom to understand, to interpret properly that my destiny was to be a great yogi. Denial, indeed, but self-denial. My deprivation is with intention. I don't starve. I fast. I fast in the name of yoga. 
And wherever I go, I destroy the erroneous thinking of others, as I hope I have destroyed yours on this day. Grieve not and arise anew to meet and greet the sun your great karma has borne. What does he mean by this? The story is ambiguous on purpose. Was it their Kriyamana which created this? Was this their Prarabdha? Was destiny at play? Were they always meant? Were they destined to meet with such an ill-equipped astrologer destined to surrender their son to the mighty Ganga destined to have him be schooled by Shiva himself for some great purpose astonished and relieved Matsyendra's parents blessed him and they then took him as their guru so he could bless them also the great lord of fishes continued to this day teaching He's continued his mission. And, you know, at the end of his life, he will join Shiva in his celestial abode in everlasting life. What on earth does this tale have to teach? I think sometimes the great teachings are but poems which point, which expand our awareness an occasion or contemplation of ideas, of paradoxes, of vistas, of consciousness that we could not contemplate before. Wisdom teachings are not information which are meant to inhabit your mind as it is. Wisdom teachings are vehicles of transformation. Their function is to alter, to alchemize the very minds which receive them. So meditate upon the tale of Matsyendra. Reflect upon the presence of destiny. Reflect upon the potency of free will. Marinate. Percolate. Cogitate. <laughs> upon the interplay between the two. The extent to which they are codependent in some sense the extent to which there are two sides of the same paradoxical coin. Examine your life. Reflect upon situations which you experience as having been undertaken of your free accord, of your Kriyamana. Reflect upon other situations which, to your mind, to your heart, seem as if the result of Prarabdha. Reflect upon the actions you currently undertake and the agami karma, the fruits which will ripen therefrom. I hope you've enjoyed receiving this content a fraction as much <laughs> as I've enjoyed sharing it with you. Keep well until next time. And by all means, if this resonates with you, I'd very much like for this content to reach people who need it and appreciate it. So please like and subscribe. Please share it with a friend, a colleague, someone, you know, whom you might think would enjoy it or perhaps benefit from it. And by all means, if you're at all interested in studying with me, I have a, a brand new course on karmic theory out. Um, my online school is IndianWisdomSchool.com. Once again, I'm Dr. Raj Balkaran, and you <laughs> are seeking inspired, informative entertaining wisdom transmissions <laughs> until next time keep well namaste